And I knew Rick's life was changed. I don't know if it was changed before that song or after that song. But I know that my life has changed. My life's been changed because of the Lord. And I love the Lord, so that's why I do whatever it is that I do. Because the, the Lord has changed my life and made me a whole person, made me a different human being. So I was sitting over there and looking at this song, which I'm going to sing to you. No, I'm going to read it to you. Anyway, I was looking at, uh, I got this um, chart here on, on how many times a word appears in the Bible. And love appeared in the Old Testament 131 times. 131 times. In the New Testament, it appears 179 times. Okay? So I think that's a pretty important word. But then I want to appear... And looked at another word. I'm going to look at two words. I'm going to look at the word God. God in the Old Testament is 3,090 times. In the New Testament, it's only 1,354 times. But if you come down to the word Lord, okay, this is real. In the Old Testament, the word Lord is 7,234 times it's talked about in, in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's 721. That's not King James. If you go to the uh, New American Standard, it's 7120. New International, 7143. And the New Revised is 6531. So there's a lot of love and a lot of Lord going on. And I just want to know that uh, I'm here for the Lord and I apologize up front. No, I don't. I I'm thankful that Gary called me to give me an opportunity to, to share with you. I'm just sorry that I didn't really have anything prepared to share. So uh, when I got home and I went through a bunch of stuff and I said this and that and I read a whole bunch of stuff and, and I could not come up with uh, anything. So I went back to these, uh, these words here that I was telling you about earlier and uh, they struck a chord with me. So I figured the Lord wants me to share something out of these folders tonight and I'm not exactly sure what. But I turned to song uh, hymn 145 and it said, love as I love. Now listen as I read this. When our Lord was speaking in the crowd, a beggar came who fell down before Christ and called out his name. The disciples quickly came and they turned the man away. You believe that? They turned the man away. He came, he said, Lord Jesus, I want to be with you. And they turned him away. But then they saw the Lord's compassion and they heard the Savior say, Love as I loved. Give as I gave. These are the people that I came to save. So, I just want you to know you're in good company. Because these are the people, us, me included, that God came to save. Jesus came to save. So we're in really good company. But can you imagine... And, and, and listen, this has happened in churches, and you have probably seen it. There's been strange people walk into a church on a Sunday morning, right? I mean, some of them are dressed in rags. Some of them are filthy. Uh, some of them are just strange people. Some of them, you know, may be a different color than the whole congregation. And what usually happens is people just shy away from them, you know? They just shy away from them. And, and they don't even greet them. They just shy away from them. And that's, and that's not what the Lord called us as Christians to do, right? So I want to tell you, one time when I was still a Methodist in North Carolina, Shalot, North Carolina, uh, this guy came in off the street one Sunday morning. We had a pretty good congregation. We had about 250 people at, at, at attending the service. We had two services. So the place was filled and it happened to be a communion Sunday, okay? And this guy came in off the street. He apparently lived, probably lived in the woods somewhere like that, but, but he was unkept. Uh, he hadn't shaved, he hadn't bathed like I hadn't shaved yet today either. I was gonna do that when I got home, but that didn't work. Anyway, so he hadn't shaved, he was kind of dirty and raggedy, and uh, he sat all the way in the back. And uh, the pastor uh, called and said, we're gonna have communion. He'd done this little sermon type thing on the communion, and he says, anybody that wants to have communion, just come forward. Well, what I didn't tell you was that we did it, we did communion by, I think it's called intention, where you have the juice, 
And you get the bread and you dip the bread into the juice, right? That's the way we did it, okay? So this guy comes forward all the way from the back. He's the very first one, you know, and I don't know where he was in his life. Like, I don't know where you are in your life or were in your life, but he was somewhere and God brought him into this church, into that church that Sunday morning, right? He's the first one. He came all the way down in front of about 250 people, I'd say, and he picked up that cup. He took that cup from the person that had it, and he went just like this. He drank right out of that cup. Now, that's not what we do. We didn't do that, right? So I'm sitting back there, and I'm saying, now what's going to happen? So what do you think happened? I didn't see that. What I did see was that everybody in that church took communion. They came up there and they took communion out of that cup. They just dipped the bread into that cup. It, it, you know, people wouldn't do that. People don't do that. So I guess my point is that the Lord was fully present in that church that Sunday, brought that man in from outside, and he accepted the Lord. He accepted the elements that day. And it was just so much love that was going on. It, it just shocked me to no end that that happened, you know. I'm just sitting, because I sat in the back. I'm just sitting back there waiting to see what the people are going to do. And they all went up there and they took communion like they would normally take it, which was a blessing. So let me read the second, second verse of this uh, song. Yesterday my time was filled with vain and empty things. Vain and empty things. And I was so busy with all that life brings... People crowd it in my way. People get in your way. Don't they get in your way? But I push them all away. They were just a senseless passion. I'm sorry. They were just a senseless bother. Till I heard the Savior say, Love as I love. Give as I give. These are the people that I came to say. Love as I love and I will shine through you. Let others see my love in you. See that? Christianity is not that big of a deal because uh, each and every one of us have a story. Each and every one of us was saved from something in our lives. Some maybe more dramatically than others, okay? Uh, but so all we're supposed to do is love others like Christ loved us. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, and you can talk to Dee about that if you want. I, I consider myself a very unlovable person for many, many years. And I'm not even going to go into that because I'm going to go to this word hate, and I'll tell you why. I, I think I'm going to start with this word hate. Um, I didn't have a great upbringing, you know. So when I use this word hate, it took me many years to get through this word hate. It's a four-letter word, hate. It took me, actually, I may not have gotten through it until after I got here in this church. And I've been saved for 30 dumb years now. But anyway, I hated two people in my life. I mean hated. First was my father. And I hated him and hated him forever. And I won't even go into that story. The bottom line is that I come to understand, and I think it's since I've been in this congregation here, that I didn't know anything about my father. I didn't know about my father's upbringing. I don't know what he lived through. I know he was uh, in the Second World War for a little bit, uh, and he got, he got wounded. I didn't, I didn't even know that until just not too many years ago, to tell you the truth. But I didn't know anything about it. I know that his father died. Both of my grandfathers were dead before I was born, so I didn't have any grandfathers either. So anyway, I finally, I finally realized that, that uh, I didn't know anything about him, and how can I hold him responsible for the, the way he lived his life and the way he kind of brought me up or didn't bring me up when I don't know how he was brought up. So anyway, long story short, I don't hate him anymore. I love him. Too bad he's gone, but uh, hopefully the Lord has let me know. You know, we all learn a lesson from other people, right? So I learned this great lesson. The second person that I grew to hate was my first wife. And uh, bless her pee picking heart, because I'm sure it wasn't all her fault. But we, uh, we, uh, I had decided that my two boys were not going to grow up and live the way I grew up with my father. My father was an alcoholic. He was abusive 
verbally, not physically, really, verbally. But I just wrote a letter to my uh, older brother uh, this, this past week, and I, I, I never wrote a letter to him. Matter of fact, I said that. I said I've written letters to a lot of people. Uh, I've written, you know, not that they were good, but I've written, uh, I've probably written uh, a couple hundred sermons or more, and I don't know how many uh, Sunday school classes that I've written notes for over all these years. I said, I've done a lot of writing, but I've never written to you, and I never actually told you what Jesus Christ did in my life. So, so I wrote him this letter, and um, I don't know where that came from, but I hated my second wife. So I hated my, my first wife, I'm sorry, my first wife. And because I had thought, well, what, well, that's what I want to, is that I didn't want my kids, I made a promise to myself that my children weren't going to grow up the way I did in, in an alcoholic, abusive father. Well, guess what? Guess who was an alcoholic, abusive father? <laughs> right here. Okay? So, I finally came to the realization that's who I was, and I said my kids aren't going to grow up that way, so I left my first wife and we got divorced. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of problems in there anyway, but, but anyway, so uh, we got divorced, and uh, the reason I hated her, grew up hate, grew hate, hate her, is because she would not let me have a relationship with my boys that I wanted to have. And so my boys and I were separated for many, many years because of her. And so I just really grew to hate her. Of course, I didn't know the Lord then, okay? So I grew to hate her, but uh, I don't hate her anymore. I, I love her because uh, she's a child of God, I'm a child of God, and uh, I have forgiven her for uh, things that she did in my life, and I don't know if she's forgiven me or not. I can't tell you that. But, but my, my point, I think, I'm trying to say is that this love that God is talking about, that Jesus is talking about, that's, I mean, I don't know where we are, but that's all we have. If you take away Jesus' love that's in our life, what do we have? Did everybody get satisfied with the election? You know, so I'm just saying, so... And, and I don't really, you know, honestly, I don't, I mean, I do care, but I don't care because I know I reconciled many, many, many weeks, months ago that this is God's choice, not our choice. Whoever we vote for is God. Whoever's going to be put there is God's choice. And God's putting that person there for a particular reason, which we're too ignorant to know about, which is okay. But anyway, so hate, hate is a terrible thing. And uh, it will drag you down. It will drag you down. Matter of fact, the more... Uh, the more I hated this separation that I had and divorce and separation from my kids, the worse I grew, the more I grew like my father. Because you know what alcohol does, right? Alcohol lets you forget. Until you turn around and it's all there in bold color. So anyway, so we got through, I got through all that and I'm so blessed for that. But anyway, hate is a terrible thing for us, for anybody to have to have, you know? And uh, it starts off, you know, it can start off small, it can start off with a little distrust, it can start off with, well, I like that person, I don't like that person, I like that person, I don't like what that person said. And you know, we have a big problem in, in, in churches, in, our, in congregations, is that we like the gospel, you know? People, people like the gospel, I don't care who you are. And uh, I do it myself, and I catch myself, and I smack myself. Around. But we like the gossip. Well, gossip can lead to hate, you know, because you tell one person this thing, and they tell another person the same thing, and most of the time we do what? We embellish whatever we heard, right? So, you know, anyway, so I'm not sure, but I have the definition of, uh, uh, I think it's pronounced uh, enmity, enmity, E-N-M-I-T. In Latin, an, emni, an enemy was a uh, enemicus, an enemicus, that's in Latin from the word we get enmity, which we use as a synonym for animosity, you know, animosity or hatred, okay? And you can't tell me that in the uh, political world that we've been living in for the last umpteen years or whatever, there's not a lot of, a lot of uh, animosity out there. Just, it's horrible, it's horrible. Hostility and ill will are often signs of enmity. So <laughs> ill will, and hostility. So I'm not witnessing really any of that stuff in, since I've been in this church, which, which I'm thankful for, but I've been in other churches where there's a lot of hostility that goes on. You know, um, uh, the first four rows back there, 
don't like the way the first four rows up here sit and fidget and move around and all that kind of stuff. And they let people know about it because they're telling the people next to them, you know, and then the people next to them tell the people in the front next to you, you know, you poor people down there go, oh, what did I do? You know, why do they hate me? So anyway, that's all stupid, I guess. Anyway, so listen here. The Bible speaks of enmity in several places. In the Garden of Eden, as God pronounces the judgment of the serpent, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. So he's going to put this hostility, right, and, and, and the sign of enmity in between these people. He did that. He did that. Okay, so that's in Genesis 3.15. So to this day, many women have a deep... Uh, I may have missed something. Okay. <coughs> oh, Pronounces judgment on the he pronounced judgment on the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Genesis 3.15. To this day, many women have a deep-seated dislike for snakes. Is that right? You women like snakes? You like snakes? I'm not scared. You're not scared of snakes. Do you like snakes? Not anymore. Not anymore. No. Well, a lot of women are. There's a whole lot of stuff here that covers all that. Uh, it's more than a stereotype. Studies show that women are four times as likely as men to have a phobia of snakes. My wife's not afraid of snakes either. And you know why? What I'm thinking here is it, because we have Christ's love in our life. We have Christ in our life. And, 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 we, and we, we can discern these different things. James 4, 4 says that uh, friendship with the world means enmity against God. Also in 1 John 2, 15 and 16, the sinful customs of this world are in direct opposition to the righteousness of God. And when we develop a friendship with the world, you know, the outside world, when we delight in the sinful ways of the world, okay, whatever that means to you guys, we essentially declare war on God. I thought that was interesting. So when we live in the world, can you turn those fans on, please? Uh, so when we live in the world and we participate in worldly things, we're waging war on God. Because God is, God's don't, isn't God trying to get us out of this world and get us into heaven? I think that's what he's trying to do. He wants us all to be there. So, um, so therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. The same warning is given in Romans 8, 7, which says that the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Now, I've been reading several different things lately, and uh, I just read where uh, a writer, I forget his name, he's a pastor, but he wrote, uh, he said that what's going on in the world today it's the same. It was all. It was all in relationship to. Uh, it's all in relationship to um, in the Old Testament where uh, before uh, the Hebrews had gotten uh, to the new land, to the new, to the new, to the promised land. It's all about that forty-year struggle. And as I was reading that, the more and more I read. The, more I can surely relate to what goes on in the world today. So what this writer said was that the things that are going on in the world today are the things that went on in the back streets back in the Old Testament days. They didn't bring it to the light. They just did it, you know, like in the alleys and back street. Today, apparently America is proud of these things. You know, all these different homosexuals, by men, by men, you know, all that kind of stuff that's going on. So, so we're proud of it, so we got it right out in front now. So that makes, that makes it, in my opinion, makes it more, um, I don't know how I want to put this. So if we're to love people, Jesus loves them, we're supposed to love them, so it makes it more difficult for us to love them because we know now how wrong all that stuff is. I mean, it's so bad wrong, you know. So we don't want to put up with that stuff no more. So consequently, it's causing us to develop this hate relationship with these people. And we're not supposed to be hating them. We're supposed to be loving them. 
Very difficult thing to do, isn't it? Very difficult thing to do. So where will we get the strength and the power to love these people? We're only going to get it, it it's, it's um, how can I put this? So growing up with my father, what I got from him, I learned three things from him. I learned how to smoke cigarettes. I learned how to drink coffee. I learned how to drink alcohol. I learned how to holler and be belligerent. Okay? So what I'm saying is it's a learning thing. And I tell this, I've been telling this, this for years and years and years. I finally, I got into the Army, and I saw a different, different life when I was in the Army. But when I came back to Maryland, back to Baltimore, where I grew up and spent my first 20 years, somehow I knew that if I was going to become a different person, that I had to leave Baltimore. I had to leave that area and go someplace else. I had to begin to associate with different people, okay? Now, it wasn't Christian yet, no, nothing about Christian, just different people, getting away from people that stood around in the corner and drank and all that kind of stuff. So later on in my life, uh, God does this, right? So later on in my life, I got injured on the job. I had to have surgery. I was forced into retirement. And then, out of the clear blue sky, I moved again to a different area. I mean, way away from anywhere where, where I had lived. And what happened then was that I started, association, so I started an association with a gentleman by the name of Bill McKenna, who uh, was a good man, different than any man that I had ever known and had an association with. He was a married man. Uh, he had grown children. He had grandchildren, I think, at that time. He was, he was a uh, retired school teacher. He was a retired football coach. He went to church every Sunday. And he was a businessman. And I never heard a curse word out of him. He never drank. So I, I, the Lord got me into that relationship. And why did the Lord do that? Why didn't he just let me linger back where I was? Because he loved me. Just like he loves you. Like he loves all of his creation. So that's, that's why he did that. So the Lord will, will change us. He'll put us in different places and in different, different scenarios. And we just have to, I think we just have to uh, share. I think share is a good word. I think we just have to share what the Lord has done in our lives. It's, it's that simple. I hear, I hear people say, and the pastor talks about this all the time, you, you know, you don't have to know the Bible. You, you do not have to know the Bible. You don't have to quote the Bible. It's okay if you do, but you don't have to quote the Bible. And I heard so many people out there and say, well, my best friend, in fact, the guy's best man at, my, at, at DMI's wedding, he said, he said I'm happy that, that you found God or whatever it is that you found. He said, but don't be putting that in my face. I don't want to hear that. Well, he heard it anyway, because we played golf all the time. And every time he made a shot, he talked to God. I said, why do you keep talking to God? You don't know God. But anyway, and then I'd say, well, God did not make that bad shot for you. You made that bad shot. So he kept hearing about God, whether he wanted to or not. Because that's all that I had. You know, I, I didn't, I can't, to this day, I can't quote very much of the Bible. But I do know what God did in me, he did in my heart, and how he changed my life. Okay, and, and that's what we're supposed to share with people. And if you go through the Bible, that's kind of like what most of it's about, is, is sharing. So, why does God hate sin? God hates sin because it was, it is the author, very anti-something anti of his nature. Anti-thesis of his nature. The psalmist describes God's hatred of sin this way. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells in you. Psalm 54. God hates sin because he is holy. Holiness is most exalted of all his attributes. Holiness. Isaiah in Revelation. His holiness totally saturates his being. His holiness uh, empathizes his moral perfection and his absolute freedom from blemish of any kind. The Bible presents God's attitude towards sin with very strong feelings of hostility, 
disgust, and utter dislike. For example, sin is described as putrefying sores in the Bible. Matter of fact, Isaiah 1.6. A heavy burden it's described as a heavy burden in Psalm 38. Defiling filth, Titus and 2 Corinthians. A binding debt, Matthew. Darkness, 1 John. And scarlet stain. None of that stuff is good, is it? Any of that stuff good? No. And, and yet, we are sinners, right? And, and we don't, I know, I know, I'm pretty sure none of us think these uh, nasty thoughts or want to do these nasty thoughts, but they just, sometimes they come to your mind, you know, they just come to your mind. So, God hates sin for the simple reason that sin separates us from Him. That's pretty, that, I think that's pretty simple. That's pretty basic. Sin separates us from God. And, and when we intentionally do it, or if, if, we, uh, if, we, if we look at other people that are sinners and we constantly say, Oh, they're sinners. Look what they're doing. Why don't they change their life? Why don't they do this? You know, well, I don't know why they don't do it for the same reason you and I didn't do it until we found God, right? Until God came into our lives and changed our lives. So again, that's what we need to tell people. God changed your life. You know, God changed our life. So what are the seven things that God hates? Anybody got an idea? Pride. Who? Pride. Charlie? Charlie Pride? <laughs> the seventh thing God hates are a catalog of sins summed up in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. While these aren't the only sins that should be avoided, uh, they do sum up most of the wicked things condemned by God. The seven things that God hates are the sins that deal with the deep hurt motives of individuals. Now I thought that was something. The deep Hurt motives of individuals, okay? So, how much was I sinning when I hated my father and I hated my mother? How much more was I sinning when I was telling people that I hated my mother? I mean, not my mother, my father and my, and my first wife, you know? How, how about when I was sitting around having beers with the guys and talking about all this stuff that my wife did or my father did or all, you know what I mean? So, how, how, how much was I hurting God at that time, you know? I think about that now. How much was I hurting God at that time? Anyway, um, so the writer of Proverbs points the finger straight at our hearts and our sinful thought process. It's the thought process. The thought process. Sinful thought process. Now, none of us here sit around and want to think negative, sinful things about people. But you can just sit there. Matter of fact, I think I've heard the pastor say this, but I know, I know it's happened to me frequently. I'm sitting around reading the Bible. I'm concentrating on reading the Bible. The next thing you know, all the garbage comes in my mind. Where does that come from? You know? And why does it come from? Especially when you're reading the Word. You know? But it, yeah, from Satan. Exactly right. So it comes. So Satan is always, always, always after us. So let's see what this says. So, uh, this is the line with our Lord Jesus Christ's elaboration of the Ten Commandments during the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.21. Sin is committed the moment it is conceived in the heart. The moment it's conceived in the heart. We don't even have to say anything to anybody. We don't have to do anything else. Just conceived in the heart, that sin is committed. Even before it is actually committed. Avoiding the seven things God hates uh, will use, will, uh, will, will help us expose our hidden intentions and motives. So here are the ten things, seven things. Arrogant, which is haunty, arrogant, haunty eyes. Just the, the, the way we look at people sometimes, you know, and the, especially, when you, especially when we're driving. And pe I mean, I've had people pull out in front of me, I mean, just right smack dab in front of me. And I don't know, if sometimes I'll say something, but you know, you know, I'm looking at them like, it, I, can, I can actually feel the hate sometimes when I look at these people because they're so stupid, you know. And they're not stupid. It's just that they got something else on their mind. They're daydreaming. You know, who, who knows? But that's on me. I'm not supposed to respond that way. That's not what I'm supposed to do. So this describes a feeling of pride and looking down upon others. That's what that is. I, I, I'm being too proud, too prideful 
because I would not do anything like that. And of course, Dee corrected me just today. <laughs> I was uh, sitting at a red light in a right turn lane, two cars in front of me, supposed to make a turn. They're sitting there. So I said something, and Dee said, oh yeah, you would never do something like that. And I said, well, I wouldn't. She said, yes, you do. <laughs> so, so, you see, we do these things. So uh, when we begin to think of ourselves more highly and with unparalleled importance, we are forgetting the fact that anything good in us is the result of Christ living in us and that the old self is now dead. So anything good, any thought that we have, anything that we do good is because Christ is living within us. It's not us that's doing that. Okay? So that's in Galatians. Often believers feel superior to other believers when they receive godly wisdom and display amazing tenacity against sin. So even within, among the church, some people feel better than other Christians. And we don't even know who they are or what their life is or what they do or what they don't do. Because why? Our job is not to brag, right? We don't brag about what we do for God. We just do it. Okay, so lying tongues. We're moving on to lying tongues. A lying tongue is one that speaks falsehood knowingly and willingly with an intention to deceive others. Lying can be used in to Im impugn the character of a brother or to flatter a friend. It is the most detestable evil to God, who is a, is a God of truth. So, a lying tongue. And I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but lying is a big thing in the world today. Somebody told me, and maybe I told you this before, somebody, we were talking about lying, it's in the family, and somebody said, to me, somebody, somebody said, and I think I quote this, and they lied when they didn't have to. <laughs> I mean, that's how prevalent it is. They didn't even have to lie, and they were lying. A heart that deceives, uh, that devises wicked schemes. This encompasses thinking, or conceiving evil against any individual or group for personal benefit or other misguided objectives like modern day terrorists indulge in. Any sin is basically a wicked scheme. David's sin against Uriah, the Hittite, and Bathsheba comes to mind in 2 Samuel 11. The heart of an evil man continually contrives schemes to bring others to ruin, whether physically or spiritually. Hmm. Misguided, I like this, uh, is, is evil against any individual or group for personal benefit or other misguided objectives. Can anybody think of something that might be a misguided objective? I know you can. I know you can. Anyway, it's a... Uh, we talk about, let's just go back to the election. You know, we pick sides. We, it's like we pick sides. I don't know that we really pick sides. We, we pick causes. I think we pick causes. But listen here. My cause and your cause are probably both good causes, but they're different. So I have no right to tell you that my cause is better than your cause. I have no right to go tell somebody else that. Speaking of causes, time for a commercial break. The uh, Citrus Pregnancy Center uh, will be here Sunday evening, okay? That's going to be part of their fundraiser. They normally, they normally have the uh, big uh, dinner and all that, but because of COVID, they can't do that. So they're having Zoom programs. So I suggested that we'll have enough people here that we can have a live Zoom program, okay? So I'm hoping you all will, will show up and we're going to have a, a little dessert afterwards after that. But anyway, so I have a passion for the Pregnancy Center, okay? I was on the board of directors for several years, and I just have a passion. And then later on, I found out that, that which I didn't know, that, and she, thank God she's a Christian now, she's been forgiven, thank goodness. Uh, my sister had an abortion, which I didn't even know about, so years ago, many, many years ago. But anyway, so I have a passion for that, okay? But Rick may have a passion for something else. He may have a passion for pickers. You know, there's a lot of, uh, and, and, and uh, Tim, Tim knows this as well, there's a lot of musicians all over the world, all kind of music, that make very little money. And so uh, 
so uh, they do have fundraisers and fund drives for them. As a matter of fact, for Tim, Tim wants us to have a fundraiser for him, he said. And, and, and then the other thing, the book, I'm reading a book called the, uh, it's called the Bible Code, Bible Code or something right now. Anyway, it's, ta- it's about, it, it, it's all about uh, Jesus being throughout the whole Bible, it's from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the, the guy that wrote that book is, I think he's a retired pastor. He was a pastor. Anyway, Baptist pastor too. Anyway, all the funds from his books, and he's written a lot of books, go to an organization that helps support retired pastors and their wives, okay, because a lot of little tiny churches, the pastors don't make, they don't make any money, you know, and so they're having a difficult time. So anyway, so, so Rick may have a, 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 a vent, vent for that, and he wants everybody to pay more attention to that than he does to the pregnancy center, you know, but it's not my responsibility or my job to say which one is better, okay, they're all good, so I should not say, I should be an encourager instead of a discourager in either, either direction. All right, so I'm going to leave that. So here's a question. Are Christians guilty of hate speech? I know nobody in here. Gossip is one of the biggest problems. And people don't think of that as hate speech, do they? No. Excuse me, I'm getting drunk. Well, even God hates that. <laughs> so, I mean, God does this, certain things that God hates, you know, and if we follow God. But I don't think that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about hate speech. Well, let's see what this says. Let me see what this says. Uh, a working definition of hate speech is speech that is intended to insult, intimidate, or cause prejudice against a person or people based on their race, gender, age, sexual orientation, political affiliation, occupation, disability, or physical appearance. Now, and, and it could very well be what you're talking about. You know, it could very well be. It depends on how we say it, okay? So sure, we're opposed to, we're opposed to abortion. I'm surely, uh, and, and I'm saddened when I hear that a lot of churches in the world, or in this country anyway, are uh, promoting abortion by electing certain people into office that favor nine-month abortions, you know. So I've seen enough videos and heard enough stories and know that's not right. So I think a lot of it has to do with the intent, okay. So we might have a, 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 I don't like, uh, I'm opposed to homosexuality because it's a sin. God says it's a sin, right, okay. But guess what? I'm a sinner too, right? And, and so, but I'm opposed to, so we're supposed to hate the sin, not the sinner, right? I think that's the way it goes. We're supposed to hate the sin, not the sinner. Love the person, but hate, Love the person, but hate the sin. But that's not what we do. We, we get so emotionally bent, so emotionally caught up in these things like that, that we just take it to the umph degree, you know? And that's, instead of driving, bringing people into church, we're driving them out of church. Instead of bringing, Instead of uh, educating enlightened people on the Christian life, we're driving people away from the Christian life, when we, whatever the topic may be. So, so I think it all deals with the intent. So Ephesians 4 says this, reference to speaking the truth in love, 1 Peter 3, 4, instructs Christians to defend their faith, but to do so with gentleness and respect. We're supposed to defend our faith, but we need to do it gently and respectfully. Colossians 4, 6 proclaims, let your conversation be always full of grace. Mine or not, by the way. Seasoned with salt. Sadly, some Christians fail to follow these biblical instructions. Some Christians, or at least people who claim to be Christians, speak the truth, but speak it in such a way that it is very hateful. Okay? Very hateful. And uh, that's just something that we have to, I think we have to work on that. Now, I have all this stuff on hate. How much time do we got left? I think we need to get rid of hate. (laughs) 
Christian faith. Hmm. Christian faith. This is the early, you remember the, uh, we don't do this in the Baptist church. But, I mean, they're in, they're in their hymnals. The creeds, people I used to read the Nea, Nea Creed and all that stuff like that. So this is, this is the early, early creed. The Christian faith is founded on Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Before the New Testament Gospels were even written, the early Christian leaders declared their brief, their belief in the death and resurrection of Jesus through a statement of belief known as a creed. The earliest recorder of the Christian creed is presented by Paul and found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3-8. And it reads, For I delivered unto you, first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's what Paul is telling the church. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen, uh, he was, he was seen of, of about, I didn't like the way that's word. He was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. So, one person, two or three people, and then 500 people at one time. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present. So most of them people were alive when Paul was telling the story, right? They were still there. But some are fallen asleep, which means they died. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me, also as one born out of due time. Paul, born out of due time. Christian faith, important to the early record of the creed. One of the biggest arguments against the Christian faith is that the resurrection story is a myth that developed over as much as a century after Jesus crucified on a Roman cross. It was originally thought that the gospel accounts were written as much as a hundred years after Jesus walked the earth. Recent scholarship in manuscripts reliability, uh, reliability and textual criticism now places the gospels at only 30 to 50 years after Jesus' death. So that's pretty quick. I mean, don't, don't, I'm not being disrespectful, but 30 or 50 years is all within our lifetime. We can write stories, we can tell stories. Yeah. There's solid evidence that the Gospel of Mark was in circulation within 10 years of his resurrection. Yeah, maybe even less than that. That's one of the, one of the ones I'm reading, uh, Mark. And of course, you know, Mark, Mark was not a disciple, right? Mark was not a disciple. Yes. They, they have many That's absolutely right. I just read that, as a matter of fact. I've I'm, 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 got this series of books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, that, I'm, that I'm reading to maybe use in our Sunday school class, too. And I just finished reading about Mark. Now, the interesting thing about Mark is, if I can remember this correctly, Mark uh, was not a disciple. Okay, not a disciple. Uh, he had a good relationship with Paul. But he was really close to, who was he close to? Peter. Peter. So most of what he wrote, he received from Peter. But he was also a cousin to, John. no, Barnabas. 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 He was a, so he had, so he grew up in a Christian family. It's, you know, and he had all these different people, input and output and all that kind of stuff. But he became very close to Peter. And uh, that's where he got most of his direct information from Peter. So, where were we here? So it was written 30 to 50 years after Jesus. So why is, this the, why is the above passage so important? Because biblical scholars use the historical records of Paul and his early travels to, the, travels to Damascus in Jerusalem place the above scripture at about 35 AD, just three to five years after the death of Jesus. So this is a dramatic. This is a dramatic. This is dramatic because those same scholars, who would hold that this basic creed of the Christian faith developed 
far too quickly for a myth to develop and distort the historical record of the resurrection. So, because it happened so quickly, uh, it didn't have time for that story to grow from person to person to person to person. So it happened, you know, quickly. Just like, uh, just like my, just like my personal story, and probably like your personal story. Okay. So. <laughs> So becoming a Christian, we not, we not to become a Christian. But believe it or not, we got people in the church who don't know about that kind of stuff. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Just just jump right up there. I don't want to do that one either. Oh, this may be interesting. Okay, how many people know the names and titles of the Holy Spirit? All of you? Okay, I'll put that back. Okay, so what are the names and the titles of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is known by many names and titles, most of which denote some function or aspect of his ministry. Below are some of the names. Okay, so... Author of Scripture, 2 Peter 1, 2 Timothy 3. The Bible is inspired, literally, God breathed by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. The Spirit moved the authors of all 66 books to record exactly what he breathed into their hearts and their minds. As a ship is moved through the water by the wind, in its sails, so the biblical writers were born along the Spirit's impulse. Comforter, counselor, and advocate, Isaiah and John. All three words are translations of the Greek uh, parkalitos, from which we get uh, parcelite, another name for the Spirit. When Jesus went away, his disciples were greatly distressed because they had lost his comforting presence. But he promised to send the Spirit to comfort, console, and guide those who belong to Christ. The Spirit also bears witness with our spirits that we belong to him and thereby assures us of salvation. So we belong to Christ. The Spirit is with us at all times. Our salvation is assured. And then we have convictor of sin, Deposit, seal, and earnest. Let me see what that one says. That's 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. The Holy Spirit is God's seal on his people, his claim on us to his very own. The gift of the Spirit to believers is a down payment on our heavenly inheritance, which Christ has promised us and secured for us at the cross. It is because the Spirit has sealed us that we are sure of our salvation. Where's that shirt? What's that shirt say? Saved by grace, sealed by the Spirit. That's our motto, I guess, in our church now. So, and then we go on and got indweller of believers, intercessor, revealer, spirit of truth, uh, spirit of God, the Lord Christ, spirit of life, teacher. I like teacher. Jesus promised that the Spirit would teach his disciples all things and bring to their remembrance the things he said while he was with them. The writers of the New Testament were moved by the Spirit to remember and understand the instructions Jesus gave, gave for the building and organizing of the church, the doctrines regarding himself, the directives for holy living, and the revelation, revelation of things to come. So, uh, pastor talks about the Spirit. Pastor talks about that's why he's here. Uh, that, that's why he's, he, he is a minister, okay? It's because the Spirit got a hold of him and indwelled in him and, and he, man, does he have a big responsibility up there? Huh? Does he? I mean, it, you know, you, you hear about different churches and pastors who, who, who don't necessarily preach from the Bible. And they just go tell stories. And uh, you have to wonder where they get that from. I mean, that, that spirit's not there. So when you hear somebody up here like Pastor Phil, and he's talking the way he is, and his voice cracks and he breaks a little bit 
because that spirit is in him. I mean, he, I've sat back there and watched people being moved by what he's, his words up there. And it's not him, right? It's not him. It's the spirit. It's the spirit within him. And he lets that spirit come through. So, the indwelling spirit. I wish they put a white background on that clock. What is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the action by which God takes up permanent residence in the body of a believer in Jesus Christ. Permanent residence. Right? Permanent. He's always there. Been there for a long time, in some cases. And he's going to be there forever. And I'm not so sure when we get to heaven, he's not going to still be within us. Something's got to be within us. I'm not sure. But in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go from the saints, empowering them for service, but not necessarily remaining in them. We, you probably have heard stories where people have been moved by the Holy Spirit, right? You know, the Holy Spirit told me to do this, and the Holy Spirit told me that. You, know, you, you got people that have started ministries because the Holy Spirit moved them. And then guess what? Years down the road, they're not in that ministry anymore. They've, they've gone somewhere else. I don't know if the Holy Spirit left them or they left the Holy Spirit. But anyway, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, Billy Graham. What's Billy Graham's son's name? Franklin. Franklin. I mean, I think Franklin has that. He, I mean, he, he, he's not a preacher like his father, for sure. But the stuff that he does around the world with these Poor people and you know, indigent people that don't have anything, and the Christmas box thing is coming to my mind. Uh, if you haven't filled one yet, I would just I would just encourage you to fill one and bring it in, because um, I, I've not seen it in person. Uh, some people have, but uh, you, they go everywhere. You know, you see the videos. The videos are real. They go everywhere, and they can change people's lives. It it, it <laughs> it's very simple. Um, this love that we were talking about before, this love that we have from Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ gave us changed our life. And that love is going to change somebody else's life, no matter how we do it. Whether, whether we put it into a shoebox, uh, whether we put it into a, a little note card and send to somebody, whether we call somebody on the telephone. Um, I don't know where this little girl is. I think I've told you before. Um, I was at a McDonald's one time years ago, and this little girl maybe maybe probably 16 years old. Uh, it was like her first day at work and uh, things weren't going right. And people were hollering at her, you know, because she was making mistakes and things weren't working. And she, by the time I got up to her, she was literally in tears. I mean, she was just ready to bust. So I just merely, and thank, thank God, uh, thank God, because I, I guess I hadn't been a Christian too long and, and I still had a whole lot of all this good feeling inside of me, and I just I knew what to say. I guess I said things at the right time. I knew what to say. So, you know, I just, I just told her that the Lord would take care of her and everything was going to be all right. Just continue what you're doing. You'll learn. You're new. It'll all get better. Don't pay attention to these other people. There's a lot of good people out there that love you and love what you're doing. And uh, I gave her a $5 tip, and you, and you thought I gave it a whirl. I mean, she just, her, the countenance on her face, I can see it to this day. It's just so beautiful, you know. And, uh, it's just, and all that was was a little bit of love that I had for that young lady at that time. How can uh, you be filled with the Holy Spirit? An important verse in understanding the filling of the Holy Spirit is John 14, 16, where Jesus promised the Spirit would indwell believers and that the indwelling would be permanent. It is important to distinguish the indwelling from the filling of the Spirit. The permanent indwelling of the Spirit is not for a select few believers, but for all believers. So it's for every, every believer, okay, not just, not just pastors or something like that. There are a number of references in Scripture that support this conclusion. First, the Holy Spirit is a gift given to all believers in Jesus without exception, and no conditions are placed upon this gift except faith in Jesus. That's all you got to have to get it, faith. John 7, 37. Second, the Holy Spirit is given at the moment, at the very moment of salvation. It, isn't that interesting? 
I hear uh, Christian people talk all the time about the Holy Spirit. They don't know if they have it or not. But yet they say they're saved. Yes. But saying that, I mean, God prompted me to come down. I haven't given blood for quite a long time, but I gave blood, and then because of that, they were able to use the facilities and and that. And uh, there's been different other times when the Spirit has prompted me to do things, like come to this church. And you know, I was given this job of being a janitor. And I was looking for it to say the truth to help myself and that, you know, and uh, the Lord provided me. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit has been with me since I've been saved. Uh, I, uh, I well, know the first time I heard him was in the Catholic Church when he told me, this isn't your home. You need to go somewhere else. Even though it's against everything my family had thought I would ever do, but I've met a fantastic woman 48 years ago that today. That, uh, today. Today. All right. Congratulations. That we, uh, I told her I says we have kids. I want my kids to know about Jesus Christ, and uh, and I've been no less. Only by his Holy Spirit, right? Have been saved and fulfilled obligations. I ain't perfect. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I can testify. I can testify to that. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Anyway, no, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. And we all fall short of the glory of God, right? Yep. So you know, he's absolutely right, but the, the biggest challenge that I find that we have as Christians is to act when that spirit moves us. You know, we, you know it's like I, I told the Sunday school class this many times, and I used to use this example. I don't know if I can do it. I used to, uh, I, would, I would see somebody stand in line, I'd hear somebody's story or whatever, and I would just not do anything. And when I leave, I would say, why didn't I do that? So it's just like, I can't do that. I'm going to kick myself in the butt. I'm kick myself in the butt. Because, you know, I should have acted. I should have said something. You know, I should have just said, you know, I should have said amen. I should have said, you know, God bless you. Or you know, any little thing like that. You don't have to say a whole lot. You don't have to give a testimony. You just have to let, let your heart speak from that Holy Spirit. I was speaking about kicking yourself. I was watching a video yesterday, the other day with, uh, uh, what's his name? It was Johnny Cash and uh, who's that fat chubby guy that plays the guitar really well? Oh, come on. Oh, I can't think of his name. He just passed away too recently. Oh, Cash. Huh? Anyway, he, he, he's a great guitar player and he's a comedian and uh, he, uh, I think he first came to light up in the Baltimore, D.C., Virginia area when he was in the service there. But anyway, he was singing with Johnny Cash and he was playing the guitar. And part of the guitar he was using, he flipped it up and was using a glass to, to do the strings with and stuff like that. And then another part, he, uh, he put his guitar strings on Johnny Cash's boot. Johnny Cash had high boots on, so he was playing like that. And he said, I used to be able to do that by myself, but I can't get there anymore because you know, you know how that is, right? Anyway, that's just what you call filling in time. So, so we got to move the Holy Spirit but here. Listen, the Holy Spirit is given at the moment of salvation. It says that in Ephesians and Galatians, emphasizing this tr same truth 
saying that the sealing and the indwelling of the Spirit took place at the time of believing. When you first believe. It's amazing. You know, there's a, well, I won't go there anyway. But the third, the Holy Spirit indwells believers permanently. It's there forever. We can't get rid of it. We may ignore it. We may try to avoid it. But it's always there. It's always telling me to do things. I'm always being told to do things. Do I always do them? No. And for that, I'm sorry. But the Holy Spirit is given to believers as a down payment, as a down payment, or a verification of what? Of their future glorification in Christ. Isn't that something? As a down payment of our future glorification in Christ. Hey, is it time? What's the time? What time is it? Ten to. Ten to what? Eight. What time are we supposed to be finished? We're supposed, to be, we're supposed to be finished. I told you, you got to put a you got you got to put a white background on that clock. I'm sorry. Why is somebody hollering at me? We, we all just got to buy you a watch. I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see it. Anyway, hi. How you doing? Good. 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 You missed a whole bunch of nothing. You, anyway, uh, anybody have any uh, prayer requests or anything we need to because we didn't do this in the beginning? It's in my pocket. <laughs> Use your phone and tell me to get out of here. I'm, I kept looking. I can't, I can't quite see that dark clock. Next week, I'll call you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyway, any prayer concerns or anything we want to talk about before we leave? Any blessings? I'm not sure, but I think that's tipping on a miracle. <laughs> I know it is. And I didn't know it was your anniversary, but I have an anniversary present back there in your office, okay, for you. So anyway, all right, let's go ahead and we'll close. Lord, most uh, gracious Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be together. And uh, we just uh, pray that uh, all these things that we've heard about today that we'll take into heart, Lord, and that uh, when, when your Spirit, Holy Spirit leads us, Lord, that we'll be... Uh, more apt to, uh, apt, to, apt to move upon that, Lord, and do your will. And then we just pray that everybody gets home safely at night and returns back to their appointed time and place. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Thank you. Amen. Sorry about that, folks.